third learning objective is to reconcile variable costing and absorption costing operating incomes. And to do that, <clears throat> we're going to need a working example. So the textbook offers a, a good working example that, uh, that we're simply just going to uh, stick with and use rather than come up with something new. So here's the layout of the story. Uh, we have our basic data here. The important things to pay attention to here, variable manufacturing cost per unit is $7. The fixed manufacturing overhead costs per year are 150,000. Notice that the units produced each year are going to be the same. Production is going to be constant at 25,000 dollars or 25,000 units per year. So we can see that we're going to incur about uh, six dollars in fixed manufacturing overhead costs per unit, and that's reflected down here. Total absorption costs per unit are 13 dollars. Under variable costing, uh, it's seven dollars per unit. Um, and what we're going to do is in the first year, units produced and unit sales will be the same. <clears throat> so we should expect no difference between variable costing and absorption costing. In the second year, we're going to make 25,000, but we're only going to sell 20, which means 5,000 will be held back in inventory. Since this 5,000 will have the extra $6 in it, we would expect that absorption costing will show a higher net income uh, than variable costing. In year three, we still make the 25,000. We sell all 25, plus we sell the five from the year before. And because this five from the year before includes the cost of overhead uh, uh, um, costs for the previous year, we would expect that variable costing will show a higher income than absorption costing for those particular years. So let's have a look at that. So here we are. We're going to compare absorption costing with variable costing, but let's go across the uh, the top part of the screen first, just because this is this is a, a fairly common. We should understand what's going on. Here's our sales each year. We sold twenty five thousand in the first year, only twenty thousand in the third year, and twenty five uh, thirty thousand in in the third year. Beginning inventory was zero in the first year. We sold everything we made, twenty five thousand units, thirteen dollars per unit. There's our cost of goods sold. No ending inventory. We end up with 60000 in net income. Now, let's just jump right down to variable costing here. Notice it's identical. Well, it's not identical because this is in a contribution format, and this is just in standard format. But notice that we end with 60000 in operating income under both conditions. As I said in part one of, of, of chapter eight video series, that if production equals sales, Variable costing adds no new information. In other words, it doesn't help us make any better decisions or we won't make any worse decisions because we, we add no new information. Let's jump to year two. Now year two, we made 25,000 units. We made the same amount of units. However, notice that we have less ending inventory. We have 65,000 in ending inventory here. So our cost of goods sold are only 260,000. That represents 20,000 units sold at $13 per unit or 13 euros per unit in this example for 260 some of the costs some of the overhead costs fixed overhead costs remember it's 6 euros per unit we have 5000 units left over so there's $30,000 in here that we incurred in costs that are now categorized as inventory so they don't hit the income statement so our income in year 2 under absorption costing is 30,000 but drop down here to variable costing, notice it's zero. Why? Because up here, because we have 5,000 units left over in inventory, each of these units is, is holding six, six euros of fixed costs. So there's 30,000 euros of fixed costs here in inventory. Well, we don't recognize that down here. So our inventory costs under variable costing should be 30,000 less, and here it is. Less ending inventory, notice we're only recording it at 7 euros, is 35,000. Because we're charging all the fixed manufacturing overhead down here every single year. So it's 30,000 less because we have $30,000 in fixed overhead costs deferred in inventory. Go to year three. Year three, we sold everything we made plus all of the uh, beginning inventory or the ending inventory from last year, beginning inventory from this year. So we're going to end with no inventory. So we sold everything plus these 5,000 units that we didn't sell in year two for a total income of $90,000. Now, 
When we charged these 5,000 units in year three, each of these units had that $6 of fixed overhead cost. We didn't charge it in this year, so we overstated by 30,000, but we did charge it in this year, so we would expect this to be understated by 30,000. When we drop down here to variable costing, notice it's a $30,000 higher, 120. Well, why is that? Is because we charge the 150 every single year. We don't hold any of this fixed manufacturing overhead cost in inventory. So if we don't hold it in inventory and we charge it fully, every time we sell something from inventory, it is only the variable costs that we realize. We don't defer or release any fixed costs from inventory. So it will be $30,000 higher in this case. So it's $30,000 lower in this case because we charge it all. None of this goes into inventory. It'll be $30,000 higher in this case because when we release something from inventory, no previous fixed costs were in it. They'd already been charged. So it gives us a cleaner picture of how, uh, of how we're performing internally. For external reporting purposes and for inventory valuation purposes, absorption costing rules the day. For internal decision making, you'll find that variable costing helps you make better decisions when inventories become important. So if you're going to have fluctuating inventories from period to period, and those inventories contain a significant amount of fixed overhead cost per unit, variable costing will give you better information. In our first example we did in this in this uh, in part two of this video, we looked at the difference between absorption costing and variable costing when sales change, but we left production the same. Now we're going to look at it in in a different condition, and I think once we see this way, you're going to see the power of variable costing over absorption costing. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at the two again: variable costing and absorption costing. As sales stay the same this time, but production changes. So again, in the first example, production stayed the same each year, sales changed. In this example, sales will stay the same each year, but production will change. So let's have a look at the data we're going to be working with here. Uh, our variable manufacturing cost per unit in this example is going to be $10. Our fixed manufacturing overhead cost per year is $300,000. And so we have a bit of an issue here because our units produced are not the same each year so that our fixed overhead cost is not the same each year. Notice that we're going to make 40,000 units in year one, increase it to 50,000 units in year two, and then drop down to 30,000 units in year three. So have a look what happens here. Under variable costing, we have a constant cost of $10 per unit in variable costs. To that, we have to add our fixed manufacturing cost to get to absorption costing, but in year one, 40,000 units, so there's $300,000 divided by 40,000 units, we'll add 750. In year two, we're making more, so we get to spread our overhead over more units, so our average cost per unit will drop. So we're going from $1,750 down to $16, but in year three, we're only making 30,000 units. So there's $10 in fixed manufacturing overhead. In year three, our average cost per unit increases to 20, uh, uh, to 20 euros. So here we are uh, with constant sales over three years, or at least I'll show you the example where we're going to sell the same amount of units every year for three years, but our production changes. Under variable costing, we have the same cost of goods sold each year, $10 per unit. But under absorption costing, our cost of goods sold will fluctuate from year to year. Not only will it fluctuate with the cons with constant sales, not only will it fluctuate, but it'll give the impression that our gross margin is not under control, that it is fluctuating as well. So let's get to that example. So here we are. The assumption we're making is that we're going to sell 40,000 units in each year. We're going to look at absorption costing and variable costing. So under absorption costing, for the first three years, we sell a million dollars each year. In the first year, we have no beginning inventory. We produce a certain number of units. We sell all the units. We sell 40,000 units. Uh, our cost of goods sold is 70, uh, 700,000. That gives us 300,000 gross margin or a 30% gross margin. Uh, less, of course, our operating expenses and an operating income of 60. In the second year, we start with no inventory. We produce 
50,000 units this time. So now we have $800,000 in inventory. We don't sell them all. We're only selling 40,000. So we hold back some units in inventory for cost of goods sold of 640,000. Now notice, we sold the same 40,000 units. But here our gross margin is now 360,000 or 36%. So we have an increase. It looks like we have an increase from 30% gross margin to 36% gross margin so that it looks like we're 6% more efficient in managing our cost of goods sold, but we're not. We achieved this 6% increase in gross margin by simply producing more than we sell so that we have more units to spread operating uh, the fixed overhead costs over, thereby giving the impression that our cost per unit is lower or that our cost of goods sold is lower. Because look, cost of goods sold for the same 40,000 units went from 700,000 down to 640. In year three, we're only producing 30,000 units. So our cost per unit jumps significantly because the fixed cost component of it is higher. Uh, so it makes it look like it's more expensive, correct? So we start with 160 in inventory, we add 600,000, we have 760, and of course this brings us back to the 40,000 units, so we'll end with no inventory, but it's costing us 760,000 to do it now, giving us $240,000 in, in, uh, in gross margin. So now our gross margin drops to 24%. We went from 30% to 36% to 24%. Observing this from the outside, one would suggest that this company needs to get its production and its cost of goods sold under control because these are wide fluctuations in gross margins. We want to see more stable gross margins, especially since sales are not growing. So let's have a look at what variable costing will tell us. Again, we have a million dollars or a million euros in sales in each of the three years. We have beginning inventories. Uh, um, the same that we have up here, nothing in the first year. We're going to sell everything we make. Notice our variable, we're only considering the variable manufacturing costs are $10 per unit. This is in contribution format uh, 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 style. Lesser ending inventory of zero. There's our variable cost of goods sold. Notice it's 400000 400000 in year two, 400000 in year three. So it's telling us that without considering our fixed overhead, we have a 60 point, uh, 60 percent gross margins without considering our fixed overhead. We'll take off our variable selling and administrative expense because again, we're looking at cost behavior. Sales less variable costs equal contribution margin, less fixed costs equal operating income, right? So look at our contribution margin, constant in every single year, as it should be. Why? Because we're selling the same amount each year. And if we're selling the same amount each year and our variable cost per unit stays the same and our total fixed manufacturing overhead stays the same, we should stay the same. We should have the impression that everything is constant, not this jumping around that we have up here. So we produce a constant 560,000 in contribution margin each year. That contribution margin is 56% of sales every single year. Then we take off all of our fixed expenses each year, 500,000, 500,000, 500,000, and it gives us a constant operating income each year. Why? Because what this is telling us is that our sales are flat, our operating income is flat, but our costs are also flat as well. They're not rising. Here, it looks like we doubled our profit going from year one to year two without increasing sales. Without increasing sales, in fact, all we did to double our profits is make more. Well, hang on a second. Can you see what happens here? If a company is faced with, with flat sales and realizes that it can spread its overhead over more units and lower its cost of goods sold, what's the logical decision to do to show, the, to show Wall Street or to show the street and investors that you're making money? Just simply make more. Make more. Why? Because you can defer... Your, your fixed manufacturing overhead costs in inventory. You can defer them in inventory, thereby giving the impression that you're making more money. So a company whose sales are flat, who's magically increasing their bottom line, is probably increasing their inventory. But look what happens when you stop making, this, making inventory and you draw from inventory and you draw down. If your sales are still flat, you take a real hit on the bottom line because you're drawing out product. You're drawing 
manufacturing overhead costs that should have been charged in this year and you're forcing them into this year in a year when your production is low so your fixed cost per unit is much higher your cost of goods sold is higher so you can see from an external point of view how this might confuse an analyst and if management is relying on this there is, the, there is the temptation to say, look, we can always show that we're making more money by just making more stuff whether we sell it or not. Down here, you'll never fall into that trap because everything is constant. Sales are flat, costs are flat, net income is flat. It allows for better decision making. This is internal. This is external.